In the same way, this drawing by Escher, I think, also invites us into a re-examination of our notions of cause and effect. I think Escher really is a, a brilliant genius, and with both of these hands drawing what appears to be itself, uh, it really does raise the question of the, the chicken and the egg here, or, or uh, which hand is drawing which. Now, with perspectival observation, I also have uh, an Ashley Brilliant cartoon followed by uh, an Escher drawing. And in the United States, this expression about seeing is believing is quite common. In fact, it would be uh, a typical aphorism what's worded down there below. In fact, if you don't read that carefully and you're used to it, you might uh, trigger the regular aphorism in your mind, which is, I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it. But in this cartoon, he's actually uh, interchanged the two words about seeing and believe. And uh, the quote is that I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it. And I think what he's trying to suggest here is that we all have these preformed beliefs, we all have prior experience, and people that assume perspectival observation suggest that although it may be possible in some circumstances to suspend some of our previously formed beliefs, that um, it may be the case that we really can't suspend all of them and we can't come to any situation as a as a blank slate. I think one of my favorite examples of this is found in uh, Ian, Ian Mitroff's book, The Subjective si Side of Science. And that book is about a study that he conducted concerning the Apollo space program. And before there had been travel to the moon and there had been samples brought back from the moon, many scientists had developed a lot of theory relative to the moon. Things like uh, the age of the moon, general geochemical and uh, petrological makeup, uh, seismic and magnetic conditions, and things of that nature. And of course, once we were able to bring back actual samples of the moon, then some theories became much stronger uh, in their credibility, and others became uh, much more in doubt. And what Mitroff did was to interview 42 leading scientists associated with the Apollo space program at about four intervals while different Apollo space shots were being sent off to the moon and, and returning. And what he discovered when he interviewed them was that for the scientists whose theories went out of favor, for the most part they really didn't change their mind at all. Um, that they might take issue with the sample and say, well, that space shot landed on an unrepresentative portion of the moon or, or something like that. They would, they would take issue with, with anything except the possibility that their own uh, theory needed to be uh, revisited. In fact, he went and asked one of the scientists whose theory was strengthened, he said, well, why don't the other people um, change their views and, and move over to some of these theories that seem to have much more credibility now that we've got the actual uh, samples that we've worked with? And I'll read a quote from one of those scientists. He said, well, they just don't change, do they? But then, perhaps if I were honest with myself, I'd say that I haven't changed much either. And again, I'm not so sure that it's always bad for science, for scientists not to change easily, although it can be extremely dangerous and irritating at times. <coughs> the Escher drawing that I've included here about uh, perspectival observation, I think asks us to consider an additional feature of perspectival observation. For those who make that assumption, they will contend that in many situations, particularly in the social sciences, it just is impossible to engage in some sort of inquiry or observation of the phenomenon without to some degree influencing or changing the phenomenon under observation. So in this painting, got an individual there who is viewing a painting in an art gallery. But the interesting feature of this painting is that it is of a city or a villa that contains an art gallery, and it contains the man who is viewing the painting in the art gallery. So this man's act of observing has actually brought him into the painting, and if he were, for example, to lift one of his arms, that would change the painting that, that he is viewing. Now, I haven't found nearly as rich images to describe uh, holism as I have, I think, for the first two. But this 
diagram taken from a book by uh, Banner and Ganya. They've labeled the left one as uh, organizations from the Cartesian Newtonian viewpoint. And I think what this image does make clear is that from that perspective, um, the foreground uh, is really the exclusive focus. But on the right hand side, the more holistic perspective, you have both the foreground and the background. It includes the context, it includes the environment. Now what I'd like to do at this point is that there may be some people who would think that all this talk about philosophical assumptions is just the kind of ivory tower discussion that takes place in academic meetings like this. So I'd like to provide a couple of examples where a, a change in worldview assumption would result in a dramatically different um, real world uh, situation. So in problem solving, and both of these examples are going to come from my, uh, my area of, of business and, and management. In problem solving, a, a, a very typical approach in an organization would be to bring together a group of people who represent different functional areas in the organization and have them try to specify and bound the problem as carefully as possible, and then to recommend a solution to either the senior executive who's over whatever area that the problem covers, or the top management team, if you will. And sometimes that works, but more often than not, it doesn't. And the reason why it doesn't is that, firstly, it's, it's usually very difficult to deal with any single problem like that in isolation. Normally, people would have left off some interdependencies that would be important or would be obvious to the person in that top executive role or, or top executive team. And oftentimes it leaves out some people that might be constituents uh, to the problem as well. So the people uh, at the top, when they get these solutions or recommendations, they often find that they're uh, overly simplistic or otherwise lacking in some way. So instead, um, and this comes from some of Dr. Acoff's work, um, where he's written about mess management which is a continuous balancing and navigating of complex interrelated messes, not problems. So you're not putting together these ad hoc uh, tiger teams and so forth, and not trying to deal uh, with the problem in isolation. A second example comes from one of my own uh, book chapters uh, about organizational communication. And what I point out in that chapter is that if you look at almost any textbook on business communication, they always emphasize this, what I refer to as this information exchange model of communication. They always have a little diagram where it shows person A, and you see person A's head, and inside there's this little idea brewing. And so then person A has the idea, they go through some encoding process to, take, to make that idea into words, and then they send that idea out to person B. Person B, has got her head will be in the picture, and it goes in her ear, and then she's got some decoding process that takes place. And if everything works perfectly, the image that was in person A's head is now also in person B's. There isn't anything wrong with what I just described about um, that type of communication. But what it does do is to put in the foreground the coding and decoding process. And certainly, in order to be an effective communicator, you've got to have some level of Competence with coding so much more than that. And what I've come to believe is that communication is really more about relationship. That what we're doing when we have interactions is continually um, checking or, or testing out trust with each other. So what I find is that what I'm really doing is looking out for and listening for the kind of the what, the how, and the why that's being communicated and to see whether or not any red flags go up for me. Uh, and if not, then I sort of go away. Managers were to be trained in organizational communication using that information exchange model, we'd probably see some improvement on the margins, but the much more dramatic possibility for results is if we are to have managers to be trained to think of communication as uh, about developing and maintaining a relationship.